Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tracy Nyer, and I'm with the Virginia SBDC. I'll be your facilitator for today's webinar. For those of you who are not familiar, the Virginia SBDC is the largest and most effective provider of customized counseling and education for small businesses in Virginia. Most of our services are offered locally in 26 different locations throughout the Commonwealth. Today's webinar is one of our educational offerings and as part of our ongoing webinar series, Google and Beyond, Marketing and Managing on the Web. This series is designed to take a look at tools and techniques to help small businesses take their business to the next level. Today's topic is web-based productivity. All of our Google and Beyond webinars are presented by Ray Sidney Smith, a web and mobile strategist, author of Solo Mo Success, Social Media, Local and Web Small Business Marketing Strategies Explained, and President of W3 Consulting. Ray is also deeply passionate about the topic of productivity. If you have any questions during the presentation today, please type those questions into the question window and Ray will do his best to answer them. Also to let you know that Ray will be providing a handout with all of the different um, sites and, and links to those sites that he mentions during today's presentation, so you don't need to spend a lot of time writing those down. We will get that information to you. Without further ado, here's Ray Sidney Smith. Thank you, Tracy, and thank you to the Virginia SBDC Network for having me here on the Beyond Google Marketing and Managing on the Web series. And just a couple of housekeeping items in addition to what, or at least to supplement what Tracy said, uh, feel free to ask questions now. You have the question panel, and while we're while we're together, Tracy will you know intervene and uh, and and ask those questions that are pertinent during, and then we'll hold the others uh, to the question and answer period. Uh, if you have questions after today, I'll have my email address on the final slide, so feel free to email. And uh, also, you can uh, go ahead and uh, tweet at me. I'm always uh, available, usually by Twitter, at W3Consulting, hashtag it beyond Google, and I'll be able to answer your questions there as well. And of course, follow at Virginia SBDC so that you can keep on in, in touch with the SBDC and the future programs like this series and other programs that they have around the state. So today, uh, I just wanted to go over briefly a couple of uh, things that you may or may not know. One is I'm a Google Small Business Advisor, and what that means is that I help small businesses uh, answer questions that you might have about the major Google products, uh, like Google My Business, G Suite, which is formerly known as Google Apps for Work, which we covered in actually the last webinar, uh, Google Analytics and Google AdWords. If you go over to the Google Small Business Community, we have a free platform where we, we help businesses do that. You just go to g.co forward slash gsbc and uh, log in and go ahead and ask your questions there. So it's a free platform. Uh, we do it as a service to small business, so go out there and, and check out that resource. Next, as Tracy said, I'm sort of a super geek when it comes to pr personal productivity, and, and one of my favorite tools is Evernote, which I'll be talking about very shortly. And in 2015, I became an Evernote certified consultant uh, for my uh, enjoyment of the product and also to help businesses implement it in theirs. So just as something to know about me. And then finally, I'm a Hootsuite Global Brand Ambassador, so if you have any questions about Hootsuite, uh, I'm happy to uh, help you out with those as well. So today's agenda is going to be really centered on answering three fundamental questions. How are you spending your time? What productivity methods and skills to use once you know how you're spending your time? And then what are the best tools to use in order to be able to get there? We'll then finally close out with some question and answer time. And so with that agenda in place, really my ultimate goal for you is to uh, cover some of the material and get you uh, in a place where we can all be more productive together as business owners. And so uh, Forbes actually put out an article yesterday, very timely, and it was called How to Balance Tasks as a Working Business Owner. And the the journalist who wrote the, the article, he brings up some really great points and I put a link to it in the handout that you'll get after the webinar. And my, my primary impetus for, for, for uh, sort of bringing it up is that he talks a lot about the idea of working on your business as opposed to in your business. And I think the first sort of recommendation I have for most business owners when it comes to productivity is to think about how much you are wrapped up in being a technician in your business as opposed to being the the owner of your business. So, you know, this comes to the to the concept of, you know, you either own your business or your business owns you. 
And in order to change that paradigm, you really need to think from a systems thinking approach and really get from that, from that level to a place of focus, organization, and motivation. And so just to start off, right now, what are you thinking about? What has, you fo what has your focus? If it's something other than being fully present here with me, then you have obviously room to grow. And, and that's the space in which I want to operate today, is helping you figure out, are you with me? Can you be fully mindful and present in the moment? Are there things that are just tugging at your attention and, and distracting you from being able to be fully present and to work on one thing at a time, not be multitasking, and still be highly productive and potentially highly profitable if you make the right business decisions? That's going to be the goal today. So we're going to be really trying to avoid this. Uh, this is, a, I'm guessing, a productivity enthusiast who uh, chose to tattoo onto his or her arm a uh, to-do list. <laughs> and then they write in, uh, in black, I'm guessing, marker of some kind, uh, their to-do list items and their looks like some grocery items and, and some other things. Uh, so, so uh, you know, we want to avoid this, right? This is a little bit extreme. We want to, we want to dial it back so that we can actually have the, the space, the room, uh, what uh, Dr. Vink, Victor Frankel talks about, you know, the space between stimulus and response is control. We want to have a level of control where we don't have to go to extreme methods in order to be able to be productive. And so, ultimately, the goal is to be focused, it's to be organized and to be motivated. And that will be the, central, the three central sort of themes of today's discussion. It's being focused, organized, and motivated. And the first stage of that is really to figure out from a focused perspective, how are you spending your time? So often I meet with small business owners and they couldn't tell you what they did an hour ago, better yet how they spent their last several months in a startup phase or even how they spent their, their last couple of weeks doing X or Y projects for X or Y clients. And it's really important that you sort of think about your focus as being something as your primary asset in your business. What you attend to is what you get done. If you don't focus on things, then you are out of focus or what we call distracted. I call distractions basically focusing on things that you don't plan to focus on. So if you plan to focus on something, if you plan to attend to something, then you are focused. If you are focusing on something, if you are attending to something that you didn't plan to, you're distracted. Very simple paradigm, but it takes out the negative sort of connotation there. Uh, this is not meant to be uh, you know, judgmental or otherwise. This is meant to be able to identify what things are distractions, right? Distractions are basically everything you chose not to attend to right now, today, at this moment in time. And so, you know, many times it, it takes you having to say, okay, well, I'm going to set aside, I'm going to write down these things that are on my mind so that I have a sustainable solution and then come back to the thing that I, I, I wanted to focus on, which hopefully is this presentation. So I like to keep honest people honest, and that means using some methods to be able to figure out what's going on in your world and uh, tracking it to be able to objectively see whether or not you are actually doing what you say you're doing. And I do that through two methods. One is SWOT. Some people know this uh, method because we use it in, in sort of the startup business phase of identifying strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats for the business itself. And I'll go over that uh, shortly in a moment. The other is the Eisenhower method. And the Eisenhower method uh, was popularized by uh, Stephen Covey, but developed supposedly, I guess, is that the, the inspiration was President Eisenhower and his idea of identifying things in a matrix of important, urgent, important, not urgent, unimportant, urgent, and unimportant, not urgent. Basically, four quadrants, and I'll show you a, a little picture of it shortly, but he sort of popularized this method. So I've bundled these two up so that people are able to sort of go through a process of identifying their, their SWOT for themselves as a business owner, and then putting those items into the Eisenhower matrix, the Merrill Covey matrix, as it's been, been known to be called, and uh, then see where things should be done by you and then not by you. So let's walk through this just very briefly. The first thing to do is the SWOT analysis. And basically you can draw on a piece of paper, you know, uh, a cross, 
and then you have four quadrants. In the top left-hand quadrant, you have your own personal strengths that you bring to the business. I really like people to write down what those particular strengths are because it helps you understand really uh, why you're running this business. Okay, It really is good for you to know why you're running this business and the, the, the features and benefits of, of being able to be uh, the business owner. Next are the, the weaknesses. What, what are the things that you feel like you are not strong enough in? Now these end up being two different categories of output. One is identifying the things that you shouldn't be doing, right? Because someone else is better to be doing it. We'll talk about who it is that might be better to do it at a later point today. But the other is then those things that you are weak in, but you actually need to do them and therefore need to foster your abilities. You need to learn, be educated, get some training in order to be able to do them better. Jumping down to the, uh, the you know, Q3 or the, the bottom left-hand quadrant is opportunities. And opportunities are basically those things that are external in the environment that are a possibility. What are your resources? Who are the people that you have that currently work for you? Uh, maybe a spouse or uh, you know, your, your son or daughter might be graduating from college soon and they have some extra time to help out at the company. Or you might have a neighbor's uh, friend or someone at church who has the ability to, to also help. Uh, maybe you know someone through someone who, who has a uh, marketing business or helps out with social media here and there, and maybe they can help you. So those are all opportunities. You should track those and maintain what, what you know, assets you have in terms of those connections, but also you know, your resources. What's your budget? Your budget is an opportunity. And so how much money do you have to be able to spend on the business? And then threats. On the opposite side, you know, maybe you think about the business debts. Maybe you think about the things that you still need. What are the things that you, you do need in, uh, for yourself? Uh, you know, maybe you think, oh, well, you know, I, I, there's some other you know, external factor in the environment that is keeping me from uh, being able to get things done. Many times, uh, young children fit into that category for a lot of small business owners, right? Uh, because they, they are external from you, right? They're not you, but they do take up a lot of time. So a business owner needs to be able to do that. Uh, a, 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 if, you're, if you're doing this part-time, you know, the business is new, maybe you still have a full-time job, then the full-time job is actually a, a threat to your business, right? It's a threat to your productivity as a business owner, that is. So you have to think about that from the perspective of how to overcome the fact that you have to, you know, you got to go to your day job or maybe you have a part-time job or maybe you have some other responsibilities that are not allowing you to focus completely on the business. What are those things that, that keep you out of focus for the business? So we do that. So I would set aside, you know, an hour or two of time to basically do this SWOT analysis. I'm going to set it aside now for, you know, give it a week, give it a couple days, whatever it takes for you to sort of resonate and let your brain do some deep thinking about it. And then we're going to come back and we're going to look at it through the lens of the Merrill Covey matrix. And so this is a sample of a Merrill Covey matrix and, uh, and just some sample items in it. But the, the idea here is that you, again, take a piece of paper, you have quadrant one, two, three, and four, and they fit each a category of urgent, important to not urgent, and unimportant, okay? And so now what we want to do is we want to place into those, those, those areas everything you wrote down in the Merrill Covey matrix, you want to identify a next step. What is it that needs to be done in order to be able to move your business forward, that is you to be productive in moving your business forward, and put it into one of these quadrants, okay? And once you do, you can start to identify that things that are important but not urgent tend to be the most important. The things that are important and urgent, you recognize that they need to be done now, uh, but you know they just need to be done now because they're important and they're urgent. The things that are not important but urgent, okay, tend to be things that can be delegated or outsourced or just not done at all. Then the things that are not urgent and not important might be trivial matters to you, but they need to get done anyway. And so therefore, again, you need to decide whether or not you're the best person to do it or utilizing a time in your week or month when you have some downtime to be able to get those mundane, trivial things done, but they shouldn't be done during the prime high energy times of your day. And I'll get to that in a moment and why that's so important shortly. So again, you're going to set aside another probably hour or so, and within that two hours to four hours of time over the course of two weeks, you've been able to flesh out 
very clearly an action plan for being able to revitalize your productivity just by identifying what you should be focusing on. And literally, that list becomes, okay, I need to focus on these things every day over the next X amount of time in order to get it done based on your estimation of how, how long each task would take. So you're able to now really focus and really get your business moving by looking at those things. And you can do this over and over and over again because as many times as I do this practice is as many times as it will be different because you never step in the same productivity river twice, right? It's your, your productivity is going to be very different at each stage in both your life and business. So think about doing this uh, on a maybe semi-regular basis, maybe once or twice a year. Ray, before you move on, why is block two highlighted in yellow? Uh, that, that just happened to be what Wikipedia highlighted. Not sure. <laughs> no, no, there's, there's actually no, uh, uh, no specific importance to me except for the fact that uh, important, not, you know, not urgent items tend to be the thing you should focus on in uh, the, the sort of Stephen Covey world. So he talks about using Q2 as your primary focus because because it's important but not urgent, you tend to set those things aside, and those tend to be the, the most important items. So I think that's why that's particularly highlighted. So continuing on, one way to then sort of what I like to say is keeping honest people honest in this, this sort of time tracking piece is once you've identified these things, uh, you sort of have to figure out where you've been spending your time. So many business owners tell me, oh, you know, I'm so busy. And I say, yeah, you're being busy, but you're not really being productive. And this busyness in the business is actually being counterproductive. So let's identify what you're actually doing and how you're utilizing your time. And one of the best ways to do that is if you if you currently track hours for billable hours, you can do like what you know a lot of professionals do. Track your billable hours and then track your non-billable hours as well. So if you plan to work from nine to five every day, I don't really know any business owner who only works from nine to five, but just let's, for you know, sake of argument, say that you work from nine to five, you should be able to track your billable hours for those times when you are supposed to be working. How much time goes into each of the categories of work and non-work and whether or not those the work that you did was actually viable billable time and that which was not okay and uh, if you if you are not in a billable environment I still recommend that you do it because you can identify this was something that is a something that is profit making or not profit making right so you can you can identify the category just like keep a track of your time for just two weeks Two weeks is usually a good amount of time to, to, to see, but basically during working hours, how, how are you tracking your time? You're going to be tracking your time and how are you utilizing your time for non-money activities and money activities? And I know that life isn't quite that binary, but when you're at work, it can be. It can be as easy as identifying this thing was profit generating, this thing was not. Okay, And you can then make the gut call for every item, don't overthink it and track the time for two weeks and then come back and look at it later and, I, and see whether or not you're actually spending enough time on the things that make you money. And if a lot of it is not, then again, we have another metric to tell us, hey, you know, this might not be the best use of my time. Now, what's really great is that there's a lot of software out there and tools that give us the ability to uh, analyze this stuff either by tracking or by automation. And so I'm going to talk about several of them, and I'm going to hop out of the presentation here for, for purposes of that. Uh, so the first one, though, uh, is called heat mapping. And heat mapping, there's a link again in the handouts to this uh, because it's a little difficult to find on the website. But if you go to productiveflourishing.com in the link that I, that's in the handout, you'll be taken to the, to the uh, blog post that talks about the heat map, and then there's a link uh, to the heat map template within the document. Heat mapping. Heat mapping is a way, very briefly, for you to be able to identify high energy and low energy periods of your day. So something that people don't realize is that uh, we have rhythms throughout every day, and notwithstanding your chronotype, or basically the times of the the, the time of day that you're most uh, alert, your brain is most active and and capable of of processing. 
Uh, so, so we talk we talk about metabolic rate and chronotypes. People are, are can be uh, morning people. They can be night people. They can burn the midnight oil. People. Some people are you know sort of noonday people. And so you know it just depends on where when you might be most alert throughout the day. But we all have a circadian rhythm. Okay, and so throughout that circadian rhythm, we actually have something then called the ultradian rhythm. And the ultradian rhythm is basically a 90 minute up and a 90 minute down uh, cycle that your body goes through. Now, this isn't necessarily a physical uh, component. You're, you're not, you don't feel physically exhausted in a 90 minute down period, but your brain actually goes into what's called a default mode. And the default mode is basically an opportunity for your brain to do a couple of things. One is that it can do brainstorming, it can do problem solving, it can handle emotional regulation, and all of those other things. They are not periods of time when you should really be trying to stress your executive functions because your brain is doing a lot of work. When your brain goes into default mode, a lot of people call this mind wandering, but when your brain goes into the mind wandering state, you should re be really doing very um, physical activity that is uh, low stress because not low stress on the body. You could be running or going to the gym or doing any number of things that are physically exerting, but you should not be using your mind to be doing lots of forward planning, decision making and that kind of stuff because your brain is basically doing work in the background. Uh, when we watch the brain scans of people who are in default mode network times, uh, they are their brains are completely lit up. I mean, it's all on fire because their brain is really doing a lot of work. And what happens is if you can identify when you have alert periods throughout the day, that's one of those up cycles in the ultradian rhythm. And when you start to feel that mind wandering or, or mind wandering happening throughout the day, those are your default mode uh, periods of the day. And if you can start to identify them, then you can start to map the work that you do according to that. And it's no surprise that if people work a nine to five schedule, that most people have a, uh, a tick up during between nine and 11 in the morning. And then people have, you know, a, a, a down tick over the course of a period of lunch. And then they have an uptick, you know, right after about three o'clock. Um, it's because, you know, our metabolism is usually processing our meals and all those other things at those times when the up and down cycles happen. And so we have, you know, the rise and fall of the, the, uh, the metabolism, you know, throughout the day, which is basically two bumps throughout the day. Uh, but then we have this cycle that's going on. So if you really start to pay attention to when you have high energy and low energy, you can do that. So long, I, I meant to do this very briefly, but the heat map itself uh, gives you a, a tool for being able to use a color-coded map. So, you know, it's basically a clock face and it shows you throughout the day when you actually have those good brain moments, those high peak brain alertness moments, and when you have low moments. And that way you can place the right work in the right times of the day. So just tracking that for just a week or two can be very, very powerful in terms of identifying, oh, you know what? I shouldn't call this client in my low peak moments because then I'm not going to be my best customer service representative self. I'm not going to be best, my best salesperson to make those sales calls during those periods. These are the periods of times when I should do those things, okay? Next up is rescue time and freedom. And I'm actually gonna hop over to, to, the, uh, to the browser for you to be able to see these. Uh, and so the first app that I really love is uh, called Rescue Time. And Rescue Time is amazing uh, because Rescue Time allows you uh, to go ahead and track your time automatically and then it gives you a, a productivity score. Uh, basically, it tells you, uh, let's see down here, it gives you a productivity score, there you go. So it basically tracks your activities online and allows you to be able to do that. And that's built into the free application, it just basically tracks in the background, it sees what websites you visit, and it, it sees how long you visit them, and whether or not they're categorized as being uh, productive places that you're going or not, and then you can uh, you know, see your score. But the premium uh, package has a wonderful tool in it called um, you know, the, the block distracting sites feature. And so the, the blocks uh, feature allows you to then go ahead and uh, block sites that you really shouldn't be on uh, during your day, right? So if you find yourself, you know, browsing uh, too much of Facebook or, you know, when you're not doing social media for your business or you're finding yourself on, you know, Pinterest when you really should be you know, writing that email to your client. Well, you can go ahead and block distracting websites for periods of time 
that you know are uh, very vulnerable for you. You know, like the after lunch, get yourself a cookie, another cup of coffee, and then you sit down to Facebook for an hour, uh, and you're you're surprised afterward that the time time passed. Well, you can go ahead and say, okay, well, every day between you know 12:30 and 1:30, you know, I basically block Facebook, and now it just goes it goes offline for that period of time, so you can't access it. And now you can go ahead and uh, you know, recoup that time and do something more productive in it. Uh, one of the competitor applications to it is an application called Freedom, and Freedom is a little bit more powerful because Freedom is actually a, a an application that you install on your uh, iPhone, iPad, your uh, Apple Mac, or Windows computer. So those are the four supported platforms, and you can install it on your computer, and then it tracks the software that you're using in addition to what you're doing on the internet. And it also has a kind of nuclear option that allows you to like turn off the entire internet on your computer for some period of time. So it like blocks the internet if you need to get focus time to work on, say, writing a blog post or something else like that, and you find yourself distracted by other things, you know, again, Facebook, Twitter, you know, uh, and Pinterest and so forth, you can go ahead and block those and that way you can't access them in, until that time frame is up. So very, very helpful. If you're a little bit geekier, there are a couple of really great uh, Chrome plugin extensions, which should also work in Firefox, and there's a wide variety of these that are available uh, if you look for them online. But these uh, three I just wanted to show you very quickly. One is called TimeStats, and TimeStats actually takes data that it collects about your browsing session and it displays it to you in uh, categories. So it's, it just basically starts to show you information about how you're using your, uh, you know, your browser. And just by tracking the browser stuff, similar to Rescue Time, it starts to analyze what things are in which category. Work, personal, you can identify things as unproductive, productive, money-making, non-money-making, and so on and so forth. And you start to see some really interesting information. And it's a free plugin. You just add it from the Chrome uh, web store. Now, these are two different plugins. One's called uh, History Trends, and the other's called History Trends Unlimited. History Trends, I think, is usually more than enough for most people. But what this Chrome extension does is it goes ahead and takes your, your browsing history, uh, three months' worth of it because of Google's data limit, and it will show you three months of history to see what are the most visited websites. And this can give you a pretty quick identification of where you're spending your time, uh, especially online, and then allow you to sort of back off of those things. So if you see that your number one, you know, visited site online is Facebook, uh, you know, you know that it's going to be uh, something that you want to do, or your favorite blog, or your favorite this or that, where you'd like to, you know, YouTube, you know, again, spends, people spend a lot of time on YouTube. You can go ahead and identify those and then be able to just curtail that back. And if you cur curtail it back just ever so slightly, you can, you can identify hours of your week that have been sucked up by five minutes here and five minutes there of watching uh, potentially unproductive stuff. Okay. Uh, the History Trends Unlimited is actually for those who want to uh, synchronize that data history from Google that they're collecting about you, your web history, and it actually saves it locally so it becomes a a local database of all of your uh, web history, and therefore you can then see a longer time frame more than three months. So if you want to see you know, the last X number of years of your history to get a, a larger uh, data set so that it's maybe a little bit more statistically accurate, you can then go ahead and do that. So if you're if you're a data science geek uh, like I am, you can go ahead and use this tool, download the data, and play around with it in R if you know what that is. If you don't know what R is, then you don't have to worry about what I just said. <laughs> All right, so, so those are just some tools that you can use in order to be able to start to identify how you're using your time and, like I said, just sort of keeping yourself honest uh, to what is it that I chose to spend my time on from identifying my strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, identifying the tasks that were necessary to get done, and then further identifying those things that I'm going to do over the next X number of weeks, and am I doing those things? When are the best times for me to do it? The heat map or rescue time or freedom or one of these other uh, tools will be able to tell you when to do them, and then you can either schedule them or put them onto a, a task list so that you can manage those tasks and do them in the appropriate and right times. 
So the next up are basically productivity methods you can use. And this falls into the category of organization and motivation. And right now I want to sort of cover getting organized. And so getting organized is really the function of basically looking at the various opportunities for being able to take those things that you need to get done and putting them in places that you can't forget those things to be done, right? You want them to basically be in your way at the right time and place. And so that's what a trigger is, right? So a, a task list or a calendar event record or anything like that is nothing more than something to trigger a behavior at the right place and time. And so we really want to be able to learn how to best utilize those triggers to help us get those things done. So I'm just going to uh, cover briefly some of the materials that I recommend highly to everyone all the time, and so I just think that it's good for me to, to go ahead and do that now. Uh, one is the book Getting Things Done, which I've talked about. I think I did a webinar uh, here on uh, for the Virginia SBDC uh, called uh, uh, Time Management for the Busy Entrepreneur, I think Social Media Time Management for the Busy Entrepreneur. So if you go to the Virginia SBDC.org website, it should be there in the archives. And, uh, and I talk a little bit about the Getting Things Done methodology, but basically the book itself is a, a how-to manual on developing a productivity um, you know, system for yourself. So it's a methodology and you build your own system. And so Getting Things Done is a fantastic book and there's a link to that in the handouts. The next book is for people who suffer with a bit of procrastination issues. And this book is Eat That Frog. It's by uh, Brian Tracy and he gives 20 different uh, methods for being able to add to tactics and more tactics. Uh, than a strategy. So it's a, 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 a tactical book that gives you these 20 different tactics to be able to handle and address procrastination if you have that issue in life. So highly recommend it. Uh, you'll re recognize that we all procrastinate in some way, shape, or form in our worlds, but some procrastinate more than others, and when it becomes a little bit unhealthy and therefore less productive for us, Eat That Frog is a great read. It's a quick read, great read uh, for doing that. The next one up is uh, is the Pareto Principle. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Alfredo Pareto was a, an Italian con economist, and he uh, studied uh, the wealth of Italian uh, landowners. And what he recognized was that the wealth or the land ownership uh, throughout Italy at the time uh, that he was doing this study was that the the that eighty percent of the land was actually owned by 20% of the population. And so land ownership was this locked in piece of, of the, at least the, the land ownership economy of, of the wealth of this country back then, that was primarily the economy, right? You know, it's, it's land ownership. And so um, I'm guessing all male because of the, the time he was doing this, but basically these, these men, 20% of the, of the population of men who could land, own land in Italy basically owned 80% of it. It's been used in many, many different other iterations over time, and I tend to apply this to productivity, which is state to say that you can take 80% uh, of your activities and recognize that they probably represent 20% of the value you provide in your business and vice versa, which means that if you think about it from the perspective that 20% of your time probably accounts for 80% of the value you provide in your business, and you can then start to create compound productive benefits by reducing that 80%. Obviously, at that point, the Pareto Principle doesn't apply anymore as you create more uh, you know, uh, levels of, of efficiencies and streamlining, right? Um, so you really want to sort of think about this from the, the initial stages of things. And, uh, and so the Pareto Principle itself can be very, very powerful for being able to identify, okay, well, 20% of my clients actually make up 80% of my income, so I should really focus on them and start to, you know, uh, segue the others off of, off of my plate. They're maybe, maybe not the best clients for me. And you can start to identify those people that way. Uh, the next one is the, the Now Habit. It's a book by Dr. Neil Fiore, and uh, again, it's a book about procrastination, but 
primarily, I really love it for something they call the unschedule. And I've done actually a tutorial on my website about this, and there's a link to this in the handout. But it's really important for people to recognize that the unschedule is a, is a tool for being able to look at your life in, in a calendar view and be able to identify those things that are, uh, you know, already in my calendar. So like, you know, I'm, I'm going to eat, I'm going to sleep, you know, I'm, I'm going to go to my X class, I'm going to go to X client meeting, I'm going to go to, you know, uh, whatever other things you have already in your schedule. And so between sleep and nutrition and going to the gym and all of those things, you already have a, a, a number of things that are anchored into your schedule. Once you do all of that, you then have to put in some uh, personal time, right? You have to put in some time for you to have time to yourself. Uh, that might be leisure, that might be going to church, that might be going and having some time with friends. Uh, and then after that, you know, is basically the rest of time, the time for you to work, right? That's, that should be uh, understood. Uh, well, most people do it the opposite way, right? They, they try and look at their schedule they try to get everything uh, sort of outlined for what they're going to do, uh, but then they don't recognize all of the other things that are uh, competing with them, like having food, eating, and sleeping, right? Uh, and then they, they don't understand why their life is sort of unbalanced and out of, out of sorts. This reverses that so that you're actually put, capable of putting in what are the things that you need to do that are already booked, what are the things that you want to do that rejuvenate you, but what, what Neil Fiore, Dr. Fiore calls uh, play, but I really like it. Like to call it rejuvenation, uh, revitalization, if you want want to think about it that way. But it's really that idea that you've got to keep feeding the flame so that you don't uh, burn out. Uh, so very very powerful technique. I, I highly suggest you check it out. Then the final one is the Pomodoro technique. And those who are timed do more. Period. Right. And I'll, I'll give credit to a, a great productivity coach, Natalie Houston. Uh, out of uh, Boston, she talks about this idea that if you if you if someone is has a timer on their desk, if someone's being timed, then Parkinson's law takes over, right? You you know that there's a time crunch, and therefore you're going to make the work fit to the time you provide it. The Pomodoro technique is one of those. So the Pomodoro te technique basically says you work for X period of time, you take a small break, and then you work for X period of time, and then you take a small break, and then you keep repeating those over and over again, what are called Pomodoros, so basically periods of time, Pomodoros, tomato in Italian. And, uh, and so the, the developer of this, uh, you know, this technique then allows you a, a longer break after you do a certain number of Pomodoros. I think it's three Pomodoros, then you take a longer break, and then you basically repeat that uh, you know, for as long as your workday is. So these are some methodologies that you can use, and I don't have time today, obviously, to flesh all of these out too much, but these are things that you can look into to really identify what works for you, what your style of, of productivity is, and whether or not they can work for you. I highly recommend people think about this from an experimental perspective. Think about this from a scientist's perspective. These are experiments. Don't think of yourself as having failed or you're bad or whatever it might be just because one of these doesn't work for you. Nothing works 100% for everybody, and certainly some of them will not work at all for you because of your personality, your history, and your various skills, the strengths and weaknesses that you bring to the table. So really you have to find one that fits you. So I can't tell you which one that is, but here goes some resources that you can use uh, to sort of figure that out through some experimenting. Next up is motivation. And I know that it's really tough to sort of think about motivation from uh, a, a more concrete, practical approach, but I really do see it that way. You know, when it, when it comes to focus, habit, and motivation, you know, being focused, organized, and motivated, it is actually that simple as identifying those things that help you be motivated. And there are a couple of things that do that, and these are the ones that I've identified as being those over time. One is most of the time you look at a task, and you can't really figure out whether or not you want to do that task, right? So it's like, ugh, I don't want to do that. I don't want to call Susan and you know talk about that X or Y thing that we have to talk about. Uh, it just, you know, maybe I don't have a great relationship with Susan, or maybe it's a tough conversation I have to have with Susan, and I really do like Susan. A uh, number of different reasons why I, I, I don't want to do that task. But when we come across that level of resistance to something, we then need to look up 
a level. We need to go a little bit higher in our thinking in order to be able to understand this. This is very similar to Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs, the pyramid that identifies base level foundational needs, food, shelter, you know, excretion, uh, sex, and all the other base drives of humanity upward toward what he calls self-actualization, but the higher level needs, needs for security and emotional stability and those kinds of things up to our sort of highest, best self uh, once we've reached that zenith of the pyramid. And so we do this with, our, with regard to our own business. Basically, yeah, you might not want to call Susan about X, but what does this really represent? Does this represent moving forward a really big project? Does this represent uh, getting rid of something that has been gnawing on you and taking up uh, creative or problem-solving energy that you might be able to utilize for other things. If you just think about it from a higher plane, just one step above, and then go maybe one step above that, which is that, you know, by calling Susan, yes, I might be dealing with this uh, issue and then that will move something forward. Well, great, yeah, I still don't want to do it. Okay, well, you know, is this a part of my, my responsibilities as a business owner? Yes. Okay. Do I want to be a good business owner? Yes. Okay, then I need to call Susan. Right? If you keep thinking upward on that scale, you can usually understand the motivation for doing something or identify that it's something that you're just not going to do. If I go up those levels and those answers are no, you know, no, I don't want to call Susan at the end of the day, well, then I can decide that that's not something that I'm going to do. Okay, and if I'm not going to do it, then what am I going to do to move this, move this forward? Right? Am I going to email Susan instead? Am I going to send her a letter? Am I just going to expect that project not to happen, so I'm going to write the project off and go out there and do some more sales calls to figure out how to fill in that gap because now I'm not going to be able to depend upon that larger project for this year's uh, revenue you know, sales projections. So figure those things out. So identify your reasons for being in business to be able to get yourself to understand why those smaller tasks are attached, those potentially mundane tasks are attached to the higher being of being in business. So I usually like to start out with saying, okay, well, why are you in business? And for you to write out those on a document, it could be a post-it, it could be a sheet of paper, and, uh, and then, you know, just put it up on your wall wherever you work so that you're able to see why you're in business. And when you come across these issues, you can start to to close the gap between what it is I have to do right now and how it's attached to the things that are that are written down in concrete terms so you can see, oh, okay, this thing that I have to do, it's attached to this, this reason for me being in business, my goal to be financially stable, my goal to have a good retirement, my goal to provide for my family. If I call Susan, will this help me toward those goals? Yes or no? Yes? Great, I'm going to do it. No? Okay, find another strategy, find another tactic. Okay. Next up is hiring a coach. Uh, you know, there are many, many uh, reasons for finding a coach, but there, one of them is motivation. If you just can't find yourself being motivated, you know, if this, this comes into fitness, you, you can't, you know, get yourself to the gym, you hire a personal trainer, right? And they're either going to come to your home and yell at you for an hour while you work out, or you're going to go to the gym and they're going to help you work harder, faster, and get to your results for that. Uh, a coach is, is just something that you can, you can rely on in order to help you excel and bring your game to the next stage. Uh, for those of you who are very interested in productivity, uh, the David Allen Company, the, the productivity methodology, getting things done, uh, is, you know, that it's based on, uh, has, has a series of coaches and, uh, and I highly recommend that you check them out. I put a link to the, uh, to their coaching website and so on and so forth. If you really want to learn more about that, you can do that. And uh, and I put a link to one of the um, the the senior trainers that I think would um, do really wait, great for you, uh, Nancy Licascio. She's great. She can help you out uh, and get you in shape from that perspective. But think about the local coaches that you have around you for any number of areas of your business, right? So. I'm using coach in a very broad sense of it, but you know, you might need someone who's helping you with your accounting. So you're going to go ahead and find a bookkeeper and, and in, in a way they're going to coach you and train you on how to keep your books well. And, and that means you're going to be able to make better business decisions by having better financial reporting. So think about the way that you're using accountability as a mechanism through hiring a coach or some kind of professional who will be able to keep you accountable as well as guide you in areas that you might have those weaknesses, that, that area uh, where, you know, quadrant two where you, where you might find yourself weak. 
uh, on the SWOT analysis. Next is identify rewards. So many people today don't really produce physical goods, okay? And this is my own sort of uh, theorizing here, but you know, uh, if, I, if I had to be sort of an economist in some other lifetime, I think that much of what causes a lot of the lack of productivity people experience today and maybe I'll study this someday because I, I just became a member of the International Association for Time Use Research and I've been thinking about uh, programs to study uh, for a PhD and, and the, the idea here is that we, we can follow and track people's times, uh, try and track people's time to be able to identify their behaviors, um, more a sociological perspective but I think I, I'm thinking of it more from a psychological perspective and you know but the reality is, is that since we don't produce things, we don't go to a factory, produce something, and then we go, oh, great, look what my hands did, I produced X. You know, many of us don't even make our own meals. We buy all of our meals packaged, ready to go. It's very convenient and very productive, yet for some reason, it doesn't feel as satisfying because we haven't done it ourselves. So having some kind of reward, some physical uh, thing to see because we did X or Y is what helps feed the pleasure centers of our brain. So what we do is we go to Facebook and we click on things, you know, we click the like button and we look at cat videos and all of those things and those are mechanisms to be able to, again, click the, the, the pleasure uh, switches, you know, those chemical, neurochemical receptors in our brain to be able to give ourselves rewards. I really believe in identifying tiered rewards. So if I do this, I'm going to give myself this particular treat. If I make this weekly sales goal, I'm going to give myself this other physical treat that is uh, a, not necessarily physical. You could do, you know, a weekend trip, you know, with the family or any number of things that you can do. But identify rewards that really show you uh, and relate to the things that you want to achieve. And those types of tiered rewards are very powerful for being able to motivate you toward them. They need to be short term. They need to be appropriate to the to the you know thing that you're doing, right? So if I'm going to, uh, you know, you should basically consider it a commission for for making your weekly sales goal that you're going to do something that's going to you know benefit you personally for being able to do that, you and your family potentially, uh, and then making sure that it's healthy, okay? So it's not, oh, you know what, I'm gonna make these sales goals and then when I get home, I'm gonna drink an entire bottle of wine. Uh, <laughs> you know, maybe a glass of wine uh, with dinner is, is probably better than drinking the whole bottle uh, for being able to make uh, your sales quota for that particular day, right? Just think about this from a more practical perspective and from an appropriate perspective. What is it? What is the appropriate reward for being able to achieve X or Y? And what you find yourself doing is you find yourself getting more and more done because you are looking forward to the reward. And over time, you may not even need the reward anymore because of the outgrowth of the productive outputs. So think about you know maybe weaning yourself off of some rewards over time and then appropriating those rewards or other rewards for other goals that you might have in your life. So you might say, oh, you know what, if I run this marathon at the end of the marathon, I'm gonna take a, 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 you know, a, a little trip or I'm gonna eat, you know, I'm gonna have a day where I just you know, eat all the junk food and stuff that I really love uh, eating you know, that, that particular day. Fine, you indulge a little bit, uh, but, but everything in moderation. The other is that related to rewards is setting short-term milestones. It's really important for you all to really set short-term milestones uh, because the, the shorter the, the time horizon to achieving whatever you're trying to achieve becomes more achievable, right? It becomes more doable, right? So as you go out on a time horizon, right, like if I want to buy a home, well, buying a home seems like a far out kind of thing, right? That's like several months to, to maybe six months based on looking at homes and dealing with the mortgage company and appraisal and title and all the other things that need to go into getting that settlement scheduled. Well, if I set the shorter term milestone as basically getting qualified for a mortgage, well, that's that's a really short-term goal because all I have to do is send an email to my bro you know, my broker or my mortgage lender or my bank and say, hey, what do I do to get uh, pre-qualification to know how much I can afford? They'll say, okay, well, you know, let's do a run of your credit report and maybe they need a couple other documents and boom, it's done. Well, what's the appropriate reward for getting to that goal to get me on the way to buying my home? 
well, I can set something really, you know, I can maybe, you know, take, uh, you know, go out to dinner, you know, uh, with a friend or something else like that as a, as a reward for, for getting that done. And that's much more doable. I get my pre-qualification, boom, what's the reward? Go to dinner. I can call a friend and say, hey, let's go to dinner. I just got pre-qualified for X amount of dollars for, you know, to go buy a home. I'm that much closer to buying a home. I get to feel good about what I've just done, and everybody's the better off for it, including your friend who you just got to, who just got a free dinner, I guess. <laughs> okay. So, um, in the sort of last uh, bit of time, I wanted to cover some of the tools you can use, and I'm not going to uh, belabor these very much because they're in the list of, of in the handout, so you can go ahead and check them out on your own time. But there are some really fun tools and very productive tools that you can use uh, for being able to increase your output. And so first up is Evernote, which I've talked about before in other webinars, but it's basically a note-taking uh, software, and uh, we'll probably have to do a webinar on sort of Evernote as a productivity uh, tool and system uh, maybe later on this year. But the idea here is that note, Evernote actually acts as, as a bit of a knowledge management uh, tool. So you can not only track tasks, but you can also track reference material. You can track all kinds of things within Evernote. It's a very flexible tool, and it, it's one of the most highly integrated tools uh, in, in sort of extensible tools that's on the market. So you know, there's there's everybody, not everybody, but many many people, many other software, many other hardware uh, vendors out there connect to Evernote. So it becomes a sort of central repository for, for the knowledge in your life from, you know, uh, you know, pictures of, of, of receipts to, you know, where do you keep your, uh, you know, your uh, Christmas decorations in your storage unit to all not, all manner of things, right? You can just basically capture into Evernote in uh, video, audio, text, you know, documents, you can put documents into it. Any number of things can go into this uh, repository and then you're able to search it to be able to find it and sort of surface it again when you need to. Evernote's a great product. Next up are task managers. And these are just some of the task managers that are, are on the market, but I always recommend that, that people sort of look at task management tools so that you're able to manage your lists better. And that could be an Amazon wish list where you keep all of your your, your groceries or uh, things that you want to purchase on Amazon or not, uh, but it's a great free tool that lets you keep you know lists of things you want to buy. Uh, so you can find these bespoke you know software uh, you know solutions to be able to do that. And these are some of those that manage tasks. Uh, Google Calendar is one of my favorite tools in on the planet. Uh, but Google uh, has the calendar function, so you can put events obviously in there. You can put all day events, uh, recurring events, those kinds of things. Uh, but you can also put in what are called reminders, so basically tasks that you need to get done. You can go ahead and embed those within uh, Google Calendar. And then you create what are called goals. And goals are like, I want to go to the gym three times a week. Well, you can tell uh, Google, I want to go to the gym three times a week. It puts it into your calendar. And then if you don't go to the gym, it says, hey, did you do it? Or did you, do you want to do this at a later time? And then it learns how you operate, and then it tries to place it into the calendar in better in better time frames, a little bit of machine learning going on there, so that it so that it can put it into better times, so that you're more likely to do it in those in the times that it chooses. And then there's workflow automation. I can't get into it now, but there's a ton of ways in which you can automate a lot of these web uh, tools that are on on you know some a lot of these web tools. So um, Ift, Zapier, Microsoft Flow, which is a, a I, I can't believe I'm saying this, but a phenomenal product that. Uh, Microsoft is putting out, and uh, and and the idea here is that you're able to connect multiple disparate services. So, for example, if I uh, put uh, post a tweet with an image in it, well, I want that tweet to also be posted to Facebook on my Facebook page uh, with the text of the tweet, and I also want it to be posted to Instagram um, or other places like that. Or I think it goes from Instagram back. I don't think you can post directly to Instagram. Uh, but you know, you basically have the opportunity to go ahead and uh, tell it, if this happens, then do that. And you can do that with Ift, Zapier, Microsoft Flow, and Workflow, which is on the iOS platform. There isn't yet a, a mature product that does workflow automation on Android. There's a couple out there, but they're not really ready for game time. 
you could always hire a virtual assistant. Uh, these are all U.S.-based virtual assistant companies that uh, you know charge you know minimal several dollars an hour up to you know thirty or forty dollars per hour depending upon their specialty and and the level of service. And uh, your alter egos, for example, is is in Virginia. Uh, Paula Atkins Boyland is is a, a Virginia-based uh, virtual assistant, and so I, I have links uh, in the in the handout to to her, and and uh, you can ask me if you need to connect with any of these others. But the uh, the idea there is that if you can't do it and you need to outsource it, you don't have yet someone who can do it on staff, then you can outsource it to a virtual assistant. And again, we should we'll probably have a topic about this later this year where we really dive into you know, finding, training, and managing virtual assistants. I've done this is really great for being able to manage people. Uh, what, what I like to do with my own virtual assistant is that we use I've done this, and every day uh, my virtual assistant basically gets an email from I've done this dot com, and it asks, what did you do today? And uh, the virtual assistant then writes out what they did today, you know, how much time everything took, and just by doing that on a regular, uh, you know, on a daily basis, I get to see what and how they're being productive. But because the assistant knows that I will be reviewing that every day, they are going to be much more productive. They're going to, you know, they're they're being watched and uh, not being, you know, not standing over their shoulder because they're virtual, right? They're not, they're a remote worker. Uh, but they know that I'm going to be reviewing and that if I don't see them doing what I ask them to be doing uh, or I don't see their activities to be productive, then we can have a bit of coaching. We, you know, I can help them identify what things are good and not good about what they are doing. Uh, so with that, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step away and let uh, Tracy take over and answer any questions that you might have, uh, and then we can close out. Thanks, Ray. We have a couple of questions, and a couple of them go back a little way. So um, back when you were talking about the productivity tools, um, somebody asked if those apps worked with Safari, not just Chrome. So, so the ones that I showed you on screen will not work with Safari. You'll have to look in the Safari extensions gallery to see whether or not Apple has any that, that match, uh, you know, the functionality there. The, uh, the, what used to be the Google web history has fundamentally changed. It doesn't now show you the diagrams and charts that it once did. So you would, you would need to find something in Safari. But I, uh, insofar as uh, what exists there, I don't know. Uh, I, haven't, I haven't really uh, uh, researched well enough what's in Safari for, for that kind of thing. Uh, but if it doesn't exist, I would, I would go to Rescue Time. It's free for at least the, uh, you know, the data to, to track the data so you can use Rescue Time. And I know that works. I'm, I'm almost certain that it works in Safari. Great. People who have ADHD really need organization too. Does this address those people with those types of problems that really affect their um, work output and time management? Sure. So, so I have a, I have a uh, great compassion for those who suffer from ADHD and other, other kinds of things. But uh, the reality is, is that attentional deficits affect us all. It just affects those who are affected by ADHD and other kinds of mental health issues uh, more, more adversely, more acutely. And so the way in which I look at it is that all of these tools can, can help. Uh, I think Dr. Edward Hallowell, who's really the, the prime expert on ADHD, uh, really um, you know, agrees with that uh, perspective, which is that uh, we try everything from a holistic perspective to be able to address those things and to also make sure that you are working with either you know a mental health professional or, or your medical professionals to be able to to uh, you know create a program that both matches your your needs medically and the uh, the sort of uh, interventions that are being utilized outside of medical treatment so so yes a lot of these can be helpful uh, uh, you know in in any number of ways to uh, communicate with ADHD uh, but I would be I would be um, uh, I would sort of couch that with the idea that like rescue time or other things that block distraction, well that's not really how the ADHD mind works, right? So you need a little bit more distraction in order to be able to focus. So you may need a tool like Coffitivity, which is a, a website that uh, produces uh, uh, sound noise, you know, basically it's ambient noise. And that ambient noise, uh, while playing, 
helps to attract some of the ADHD mind so that you can actually focus your attention on something, you know, one thing at a time. So there are some really great tools out there that will help uh, that as well. So it's not, it's not like all the tools will be helpful for you, but these focusing tools, you really do have to find those that are focused specifically for ADHD, but all the others I, I think would be uh, perfectly useful. Well, here's the big elephant in the room. Ray, can you address productivity tips with respect to email? Sure. So actually in the handouts, I, I, I purposefully avoided email. <laughs> um, and uh, there, there, are, there are several um, uh, tools that you can use to be able to uh, reduce email and also, you know, address the current email inbox. Uh, one is that you can declare email bankruptcy out the gate. Uh, so my, my standard rules are declare bankruptcy, right? Take everything in your inbox and immediately move it into a temporary holding space and you know, just call it to be processed and start from scratch. And every day you clean your inbox uh, like your life depended upon it. And keeping your inbox at zero to a, a, a minimum of email in it allows you to be able to function appropriately with the world. Then you basically take today's email, yesterday's email, and the oldest day's email in that bankrupt folder and process it. What has to be done with it? Does it get deleted? Is there actions associated with it? Or does, or does it have to go to someplace else? Or do you have to reply to it? Those kinds of things. So uh, you do that over time, then you work yourself out of the hole that is your email. But it's really important to deal with today, yesterday, and the oldest day's email. And to be quite honest, you know, most of that email is trash. So you could probably categorically identify email, you know, do a search based on category, highlight, you know, all the email from your, the newspaper that you, you know, the news outlet that you subscribe to or the email newsletters that you subscribe to and just delete them, you know, or archive them if you're afraid of deleting. Uh, but you can really do a lot in terms of culling that down to a, a minimum and then dealing with today and yesterday, that way you're always cleaning up the rear guard, right? So if you missed yesterday, you're always going to handle today's email and yesterday's email, at least on a daily basis, and the oldest day's email. You didn't create all that email backlog overnight, and so you should not plan to actually address it all overnight. And so if you need to triage, identify specific emails to, you know, respond to those and deal with those immediately, fine, uh, but keep that to a minimum. Because the reality is, is that that email is six months, a year old. Nobody is expecting anything yet from you for that tomorrow. So you might as well work through it in a, a logical method, you know, methodological perspective. And I find that the today, yesterday, and oldest days email technique really works for a lot of people, especially once you've taken that email out of your inbox and now you actually see what your daily influx of email is. Great. There are no more questions. So thank you all for participating today. Today's webinar was recorded and it will be posted on the Virginia SBDC website under live webinars and recordings. Tomorrow you'll be receiving a follow-up email on the webinar and there will be an evaluation link in that email. Please help us to continue to improve our training by taking the time to complete the evaluation. If you'd like to fill the evaluation out now, I did post it in the chat window and would love for you to do that. Our next webinar is on the 23rd of February worry how to write your next book using a small business blog. Thank you everyone for participating today.